Oh, my head hurts already. I'm going to make an espresso while we're talking. How's that? It's going to be a lot of noise in the background. You're just going to push a button. No, no, because I'm not at... Uh... Well, yeah, I am going to push a button. But what's the difference? <laughs> oh, it's not really making it. It's sort of just having the machine produce it. Well, you never really make it. Well, who, if you, who if really you makes go, it? The advice provided on this podcast is general advice only. All statements made are considered by the participants to be accurate, but accuracy cannot be guaranteed. It has been prepared without taking into account your objectives, financial situation, or needs. All participants in this podcast may have a financial interest in any or all of the products or securities mentioned. Before acting on this advice, you should consider the appropriateness of the advice, having regard to your own objective, financial situations, and needs. If any private products are detailed on this website, you should obtain a product disclosure statement relating to the products and consider its contents before making any decisions. Where quoted, past performance is not indicative of future results. Welcome to episode 35 of The Money Path with Bob Iacchino and Mike Arnold. Today's What and the Why segment is sponsored by Motive Wave. Go to pathtradingpartners.com and download your 14-day free trial. So let's join Bob and Mike with an exciting conversation that's casual on the markets. So, are we actually going to start with recap today or are we going to jump right into the jobs? Let's start with recap. We're starting with recap? Yeah, and I am i didn't see it in the notes, Mikey. Didn't you make a Bank of America call? Because didn't the, didn't we point out either the monthly chart or the weekly? I'm, I'm not remembering that, but I think we did. Uh, and I, let me. I feel like on the monthly, yes. there was a clean double that had triggered. And considering, you know, we're up a quarter of a percent. It's we can talk time. about Bank of America because I have I, I pulled up my Bank of America chart, which has yeah. all the levels and projections on it. Yeah. This was a sloppy double. Sloppy double on the weekly, right? Yes. Which when we're nowhere close to the target yet. No, 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 no. We yes. have rallied substantially from when it triggered. Yeah, we have. So that's really what I wanted to talk about because I just want to make sure that people don't think. You know, oh, they recommend a Bank of America, and then they're out. We're not out. That's that's a longer term trade, as Mike has mentioned. And since it's on a weekly chart, it could take many, many weeks. Yeah, many, many weeks. But I think that's it's triggered. It's all good. We're in it, and that's probably enough of an update on that one. Uh, update on silver. Silver. You know, we traded down close to where we'd move our stop, and again, that we weren't actually shorting this. We we're looking for a place to buy it, based off of what we'll get into later today. Silver's rallied back up to nineteen. Strong rally, but this does not invalidate the pattern yet. It just means it's, it's returned to the breakdown zone of the double. Mm -hmm. Copper. Still you, not following the, the other metals. Copper. Let's, let me get out. This is on a daily, so I have to switch my time frames. Mm -hmm. Else, you know, else I would not be lucky. Copper's just stalled out for the last essentially week at this $2.07 to $2.08 range. But we have the declining rotation zone, which could, again, push it lower to its eventual target, which is around 202 to 203. Yeah. So no, no update on copper. Uh, let me check Cisco. We talked about Cisco. Cisco's up. Cisco. Oh, wow. I haven't looked at Cisco in a couple days. And Cisco's up a percent today. Wow. What I said, you know, we'd hit we my first calls are in thirty one seventy five. The high a few days ago was thirty one seventy. We we came back down and returned to the breakout zone and the rising rotation zone. And now it's gone through thirty one seventy five. We're at thirty one ninety three as of this recording. Next target thirty two twenty five. So we talked about those key levels. Let me look at my weekly also for that because, ooh, I got to go to a much bigger time frame because then I also talked about the eventual this thing could stall out. I would not be surprised to see it return to 30, the highs in 2007, 34, 24. So I would not be surprised to see it return to that over again. That would be on a weekly time frame so this, that could take a while 
Uh, hey, hey, Bob, could you recap? There's been a lot of stuff on Herbalife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think we should retouch on that because this is like he said, she said, I'm, I'm doing this. You want to talk about egos? <laughs> yeah. Bill Ackman, Pershing Square, um, Carl Icahn. I forget the name of Icahn's hedge fund. Um, I don't know. We can look it up. Anyway, uh, Bill Ackerman versus Carl, Carl Icahn again. If anybody wants to see something really fun, just Google Ackman versus Icahn. Okay. Ackman is spelled A-C-K-M-A-N, and Icahn is not spelled I-C-O-N, although he's an investing icon. It's I-C-A-H-N. And so about, I don't know, a little over a week ago, Mike, maybe a week ago, um, Bill Ackman came on CNBC and said, so Bill Ackman has been shorting Herbalife for a long, long time, claiming they're a pyramid scheme. And Carl Icahn, among others, came to Herbalife's defense and not only came to Herbalife's defense, but bought a bunch of the stock. Uh, When Bill Ackman first started talking about uh, it being a pyramid scheme, the stock took a real hit, lost about 50% of its value. And then Icon bought in. This was like in 2013, 2014. Icon bought in in the 30s, went all the way up to 83.51. It's been falling since. Um, so last week, Bill Ackman came on and said that he got contacted by Jeffries, an investment firm, um, because there was a large long in Herbalife that wanted to exit their trade and they were trying to shop it around rather than go to the open market. And he claimed it was Carl Icahn, and he did this whole thing about how Carl is going out. He clearly knows the company is doomed if he's getting out. Um, He finally agrees that I'm right. Carl and I are friends. We made up, and they came to me because they know I have these shorts I might want to cover at a better price. Um, He declined to buy it, he says. Carl Icahn comes on CNBC and says that Ackman's crazy. He did sell some, but now he's buying more. And this like is the said, ego oh, I'm thing. not going to buy like 2.6 million more shit. Yeah, this is, this is the <laughs> ego thing. When, when Ackman came on and said that um, Carl Icahn was shopping his shares, the stock plummeted, right? It, it had closed the previous day um, in the 60s, I'm going to say 61 something. And it opened up the next day. My chart stuck. Come on. It traded down to 57.10, and then it rallied then, then, you know. Yeah, it closed the previous day, 61.93, went down to 57.10, and it has since rallied back. Uh, It's in the mid-61s right now, uh, 61.20 or so. And uh, Icon came on and said, not only did I I not do that, that was not me, but I'm buying more. And recently, uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact, Carl Icon, quote, doesn't believe any professional short seller would ever take a position in Herbalife with these numbers, meaning they're a massively profitable share, uh, company, according to Icon. Now, Herbalife is putting a bunch of uh, videos on their site. One of them is a complete breakdown of how Ackman is completely self-serving, and he just wants this company to collapse so he can make money. But during the course of this, Ackman has suffered the worst performance in his history. Between this and a stake he took in Valiant, um, he is getting smoked. And by his own admission, it's like the worst performance in Pershing Square history and the worst performance in his own personal investing history, continuing to fight these two fights. So in a teaching moment, Mikey, this is a lesson of you're not always right. No matter how strongly you feel about something, um, you're not always right. The market is always right. And you should have an exit plan. <laughs> mm-hmm. But this is just funny. I, I bet you icons actually, you know, he they're because you can do the funny thing is you can also do stuff in if you want to hedge your shares, you can do other things in the options market and everything. They don't have to disclose all this. They have to disclose stock if they own a certain amount, but they don't have to disclose all those things you could do in secondary markets. It's almost like I, I Ackman wanted to pull a Carl Icahn, or, and, and by pull, I don't mean do some sort of trick, but Ackman's supposedly took a $500 million hit um, on a J.C. Penney trade, which he called probably the worst investment I've ever made. He's not willing to call Herbalife the worst investment, even though it's led to larger losses than that, because he still thinks it's going to be profitable and it's going to zero. But in 2011, Carl Icahn wrote a letter, I think it was to the Harvard Business Review, where he called 
Blockbuster, the worst investment I ever made. And he said that their massive debt and inability to adapt to changes in the industry led to its downfall. Carl Icahn took a big, long stake in Blockbuster as it was falling and uh, did not recognize that Netflix was the absolute demise of Blockbuster. And um, he, it, it's like Ackman is trying to follow in Icon's footsteps, just basically fighting this and fighting it and fighting it until it just it's not going to blow up his fund. He's got billions of dollars, but he's been getting redemptions, and that's not a comfortable place for Ackman. Yep. We have one more follow-up. Did you see we talked about the EpiPen last week? Yeah. It, we said they should just cut the price, and they did. Well, they're do now. They're doing coming out with a generic one. <laughs> All right, that's the price cut, right? Yeah, three hundred bucks. They come. They're coming out with their own generic, which, uh, by the way, is not unusual. No. Um, as a as a drug goes into patent, an EpiPen was not in patent, but as a drug comes off of patent, it's not unusual for the company that's making it to make uh, a generic because the company that has approval already from the FDA does not have to get a second approval for a generic. Isn't the only thing that's still on patent with that is the the little needle thing? Yeah, the transmission method. Yes, the trans and that's the oh, supposedly the only thing the FDA uh, does not approve on the couple of competitors that want to come out to market. Yeah, so ridiculous. Yeah, it's all ridiculous. So there's our follow-up for the week. Now we get to get into the big news of the day. This is our favorite Friday of each month. Yeah, I love this one. What, what, what would that be, Bob? Jobs number, non-farm payrolls. The economy added 151,000 jobs in August. Market was looking for, I think, around 180. 180. 180. Okay, the unemployment rate was unchanged, 4.9%. Um, market expected it would go to 4.8. Hourly wages were up $0.03, 0.12% um, <clears throat> from a month ago. We're up 2.4% from a year ago, hourly wages. Um, stuff to do, stuff to talk about, but let me go through this first. Revisions net out to 1,000 fewer jobs added over the past two months. The change in non-farm payroll employment from June was revised down from plus 292 to plus 271, and the changes for July was revised up plus 255. Uh, I'm sorry, from plus 255 to plus 275. Um, with these revisions, employment gains in June and July combined were 1,000 less than previously. So it was, it's essentially a wash. Yeah. And the three-month average um, dropped. It's now 232. I think it was like about 239 before. Um, but some interesting things going on behind the number. What do you think of these, Mike? Uh, I mean, it's – well, we'll have to get into what the – I mean, it's really – everybody's watching – they watch this number anyways, but everybody was really watching this one because of the uh, – you know, is, is the Fed going to hike – uh, so which we'll talk about our thoughts on that later. I, you know, it was it was somewhat. It wasn't a terribly strong report. It wasn't terribly weak. It was less than the, what the street was looking for. Uh, average hourly wages. Yes, they're up, but they're. I don't think they're where the Fed wants them to be. I agree. Uh, you know. I was I was thinking yesterday. I'm like, if 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 August comes or September job report, you know, which was the August numbers, uh, comes in strong, I don't see how the Fed and I I've said I'd be shocked if they go in September. I actually was thinking about this all week. Going if it comes in strong, I don't see how they credibly could not hike in September or they lose. They've already lost credibility, but they just be flushing any <laughs> remaining credibility down the toilet. Now it gives them another. If they want an out, if they don't want to hike in September, it gives them another out. Yeah, it's interesting. There's some interesting things behind the number. Um, for example, um, employment in food and drinking establishments continues to trend up, uh, plus 34,000 in August. And over the year, the industry's added 312,000 jobs. So what do we know about food and drinking establishment jobs? Um, they're low paying and they tend to be part time. Um, when you look at healthcare, healthcare fell off, which is unusual. Um, it continued to trend up, plus 14,000 in August, but the average monthly gain over the prior 12 months was plus 39,000. That you can kind of extrapolate that out to the overall problems in healthcare. 
that maybe with some of we heard recently that another company dropped out of the exchanges, the Obamacare exchanges, and you might say that okay, healthcare is starting to slow their pace of hiring um, because they're going to struggle financially. So when you're looking at healthcare stocks, you might want to think about that because this is the first month. Uh, not only was it well below the average, but it was less than half of the averages. Um, mining fell. 6.1 million people work part-time for economic reasons in August. Um, that's unchanged, but that's a big number. Uh, to me, the overall employed, it shouldn't be 6.1 million. And when they say that's a number from economic reasons, the understanding behind that is they want to work full-time but can't get anything full-time, either that they like or that pays them enough to do it. And then the one thing that the number that really, really bothers me um, is what they call uh, involuntary, um, I'm sorry, marginally work, marginally attached workers. So 1.7 million were marginally attached to the labor force. They're called discouraged workers. I'm sorry. 576,000 of them want to work but aren't looking because they don't believe there's jobs anymore. So those people are likely, 576,000 of those people are likely to fall out of the labor force in the near future, meaning that the unemployment number could go down without anybody else getting a job. That's, uh, that's troubling because you should see that number shrinking and it's steady. The discouraged workers number should shrink. Um, it's the same as it was a month earlier, 1.7 million. So it's not increasing. But until that number starts shrinking at a dramatic rate, this is not a robust jobs market. We're going to jump around a bit right now, you know, because we can talk about some other numbers that came out this week and then, you know, talk about a little bit about some Fed stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll loop back to some of the other stocks that were in the news this week. But Monday, hey, personal income numbers came out pretty much in line, 0.4%, uh, expected 0.4% in personal spending, up 0.3%, expected 03 So that came in line. Uh, Thursday, though, this was – did you see the uh, ISM manufacturing numbers? Yeah, and before you go into this, I want to make sure everybody knows Mike was all over this. In If you go back maybe four or five podcasts, Mike was talking about he saw some troubling signs in the ISM numbers. Uh, the numbers were still well above 50, but Mike was saying that he was seeing some declining stuff that might lead to us dropping below 50. Um, so go ahead. And so, yeah, we uh, – the July reading was still 52.6, and as Bob's talked about many times, anything above 50 is expansion. Anything below 50 is considered contraction. Well, the new orders index registered 49.1%, which is a decrease of 7.8 percentage points from July reading of 56.9. Uh, oh, and the overall PMI registered at 49.4%. The employment index uh, only registered at 48.3%. So a lot of this, there's some uh, weakness that I've been expecting in this PMI that's finally starting to show up. Again, you, we could easily bounce back above 50, but this is, this is showing some other hints that not everything, you know, we're getting a lot of mixed data. Some things is okay, some things not okay. Ugh. I mean, how do you think this all plays together? I think that um, <clears throat> the main point we have to look at from a trading standpoint, in my mind, is what it does to the Fed. And again, we're going to touch on that a lot later. You can have a blip below 50, but you certainly anyone who is calling this a robust expansion um, is not seeing the data. I've been on record on this podcast and elsewhere saying that I think the economy is strong enough uh, to sustain a rate hike. You can't start seeing ISM numbers below 50. All right, this is a one-time blip, that's fine. But I don't think it should be enough to give the Fed pause, but I think it will be enough between this jobs number and the ISM. Again, we saw strong, durable goods, but right. you could have one blip up in strong, durable goods as well. So we're at that point where now you've got conflicting signals and they're both one-time conflicting signals, so we have to see more data. But it's plenty of plenty of cover for the Fed to hold off in September so what's and your, not give the political as an excuse. Right. What's your call then for September? Go, no go? No go. Well, before the before this print came out today, we talked about the odds, you know, mm -hmm. 
The the odds before for September were 36. After the jobs print this morning, now it's down to 22. Uh, November, which I, that would blow, blow my mind, but it was 40 percent before, 28 percent uh, after the jobs report. December, 59 percent before, 55.4 percent after the jobs report. So it, it's looking like people are still focused on December. Yeah, I relate this to like the quarterback getting hurt before the big game and then the odds change in Vegas. You know, I mean, that's the jobs number is the quarterback. And now they're revealing that he has a high ankle sprain, but will play. Sports corner. (laughs) We still need. All right. We We need a real sport. (laughs) Why don't you have a badminton sound effect then? It's like. I got an E. I got an email about that that I didn't tell you guys a couple of weeks ago or a week ago. Some guys like bowling is a sport. What do you bowl? Like I don't bowl. <laughs> I bowl. Don't. I'll make a commitment to change the sound effects, and I have one here. Toilet flush. I gotta get that one in here. Well, how are you relating toilet flushing to bowling then? You said it was. Uh, you said earlier <laughs> something was flushing down the toilet. I'm like, oh, that would be a great yeah. sound. <laughs> well, I want to stay on something, Bob. All right, so we're both saying no rate hike in September. Yeah. All right. So we've we've made our it's it's in it's been recorded now. Mm-hmm. So there's our I don't think anything else that can really come out in September that would reverse this. So I I'm sticking to this. Uh I want your thoughts on what Fisher said this week. Uh he said, well, clearly there are different responses to negative rates. If you're a saver, they're very difficult to deal with and accept, although typically they go along quite decent. Let me restate this. <laughs> it choked me up. I'm, I'm so flabbergasted that he actually came out and said this. They're very difficult to deal with and to accept, although typically they go along quite decent with quite decent equity prices. So they're saying, oh, All right. you know what? He's too upset. Here's what Fisher said. You say it. <laughs> He's too upset. Well, clearly there are different responses to negative rates. If you're a saver, they're very difficult to deal with and to accept, although typically they go along with quite decent equity prices. But we consider all that, and we have to make trade-offs in economics all the time. And the idea is lo- the lower the interest rate, the better it is for investors. All right, do you want to go first? No. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go first. If you're a saver, they're very difficult to deal with and accept, although typically they go along quite decent with equity prices. Someone who is getting killed on their savings account is not saying, oh, well, I guess I'll buy Google. Okay, that's not the same person. You're hurting retirees who have been told their entire life, even if they were ever in the stock market, to get out when they retire. They are now whacking away at their savings because their bonds are earning nothing and they're getting crushed. So when you compare how it's difficult to deal with if you're a saver, but they go along with quite decent equity prices, that's crap. I mean, that's horrible. I like Fisher until I read this. And then when he says we have to make trade-offs all the time in economics and the lower the interest rate, the better it is for investors. Investors, that should not be the trade-off. The vast majority of people do not own stocks. The vast majority of people in the United States do not own stocks. They may own some in their IRA, which they can't touch. They may have a small investment account somewhere that their grandmother has for them or something. But people that are struggling don't own stocks. You're not helping. I mean, he's basically saying we're not helping the broader economy without actually putting it on Congress. I wish these guys would get some stones and say, by the way, Congress, this is all we can do is help stocks. Why don't you do something? Uh, This just, this statement just really fried my beans because it's almost, (laughs) can we have a sound (laughs) effect for frying my beans? It's the funniest thing you've ever said. (laughs) Gosh, we do not have a, I'm not even going to go there for frying (laughs) beans sound effect. I want a beans frying sound. It did, oh, it's a horribly irresponsible. It's, it's like, okay, savers, savers, you're taking it in the short. Retirees, you're taking it. You know, anybody who did, you know, did the right thing and saved money and, you know, they're – why don't you just – I uh, take it. Why don't you just go, hey, go buy some equities. You know, they're doing great. Go just invest in the stock market, which, you know, more and more people are sort of 
being forced into it almost. But they're riskier assets. We could, like, you're retired. Let's say the market, we get our 20% correction at some point. And you know, I couldn't make anything in my account, so I stuck it all in the equities. And now, oh, geez, there's 20% I can't afford to lose because this is just irresponsible. This is a bunch of crap. And that's really what they think. And then they, I don't know how they can't say, Oh, well, you know, we we don't inflate the prices of stocks. You know, we don't have anything to do with it. Well, they're just admitting they do it. Yeah. It's horrendous because all you got to do is pull up an S&P chart. And you notice that since 2000, we've had at least two 50% falls in the equities. That's only in 17 years. The, the equities have lost more than half of their value, more than half, twice since 2000 and they've lost 10 15 20 percent multiple times and if you're this is the whole reason that for years and it's still right that when you switch to retirement mode you have to be minimally invested in stocks because if you hit one of those 50 percent corrections you can't afford your medicine while you wait for it to not only come back but to then increase and as the market is coming back you're spending that money that needs to be in the market when it does come back it's a horrible statement for a central banker to make. Yep. It's 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 awful. It's horrendous. I can't I can't stress enough how bad that was. Mike sent me that statement during the week. I didn't see it. And I sent back WTF. Like, are you serious? Did he actually say that? I sent you the interview too. I mean yeah. I was like, here. <laughs> it's 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 horrible. I'm not a Rick Santelli. I'm not a central banking basher because our job is to figure out what's going on, not what's right or wrong. But this is wrong. That's wrong. What about the mattress investment? Well, it's, you almost have a better chance in a mattress because there's no chance of your mattress taking a dollar from you. The Fed <laughs> might go to negative rates, but there's no chance that a mattress steals one of your dollars when you put 100 in it. If the Fed goes to negative rates, you could be putting $100 in the bank and getting back 98 Yeah, it's, it's – uh, we, uh, can we shift – I want to sw- shift yeah, another quick shift. Talk, topic because did you see Switzerland's central bank? Yeah. Switzerland's central bank now owns more publicly traded shares in Facebook than Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> Just give us our money. To stop. If you, why can't we have – if we're going to do radical things, why can't we do no taxes? Instead of taking our taxes and buying stocks, why can't we buy the stocks? Here, the the, the Swiss National Bank, the SNB, uh, is their their central bank is now the eighth biggest public investor in the world. Uh, <laughs> in stocks or in, in general? Yeah. Wow. The SMB is, quote, this is a quote, uh, the SMB is a bit of a corner. They've acquired a lot of foreign currency, and as part of their efforts to weaken the franc, they have to invest it somewhere. So the, the bond market part is, is drying up, so they're, so they're going increasingly for equities. <laughs> it's like we're watching the fall of Rome, but the yep. Rome, is, Rome is the G20. It is. It's, not, it's the, the global group of 20 most advanced nations. Like, I, I don't know. I mean, I hope um, I hope this stuff takes as long as it seems like it will to come to front. Like, there's a lot of people, Mike's in this camp, that thinks we're going to see it soon. I don't know that we're going to see it soon, but I know we're watching the, the the causes for the demise of this entire system. It's awful. Yep. Uh, I just have to jump back. I'm going to jump back to stocks now, but something that just came across the headlines, mm-hmm. which we well, – because we've talked about Lulu before, Lululemon. Yeah. Uh, oh, this is the headline that just came across from CNBC. Mm-hmm. And this, I love this. Lululemon sh- shares tumble 10% as Wall Street pokes holes in yoga pants makers' results. <laughs> That's just <laughs> show oh, title, a, show title. That's yoga a great, pants. That's a great, that is a That's great, a great one. headline. That is a great one. <laughs> so Pokes holes in yoga pants. <laughs> show title. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, have I told you I like this stock? I mean, it completely got crushed. It got cr- It was trading a few days ago up at 80, 81, 81. Now it's trading 69, 26. Uh, yeah, it, it was a recommendation I did earlier in the month on Business News Network Canada. We don't have to play the clip, but it went up about, it was about 10, no, not quite 10%, about 5%. 
since I made that call. And then obviously this, I mean, this is just a horrendous I, I guess they collapse. What, what did they guy or uh, uh, let's see. After company reported a comparable sales miss and weak guidance. So that's really, they've also guided, you know, that, that weak guidance. So they're already saying, hey, guys, don't expect much from us in the uh, third quarter. Uh, like, for example, Citigroup reiterates buy rating, but lowers <laughs> the price target to 85. <laughs> this is what we make fun of analysts sometimes. Hang on, it's trading sixty nine twenty five right now. I'm going to lower my my rating, my price target seventy. There you go. Now I was right. Analysts do that all the time. They lower their ratings or their price target, and then when it reaches it, they send out an "I was right" email. <laughs> it has reached our target. We just lowered it from eighty nine to eighty five. Um, but Morgan Stanley downrated them. Market Watch downrated them. But Credit Suisse. Um, uh, what did Credit Suisse do? Credit Suisse reiterated and outperform, but they lowered their price target to 76. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, they lowered it to 76? Yeah. It was trading 76 a couple days ago. Yeah, I know. This came out uh, today. <laughs> they lowered it to 76. Wait, you? it was there a couple days ago, and now it's like, oh, let's just lower it to where it was? Yeah. <laughs> God, I, and I would not be buying this stock yet. This could have more Horrible downside per, uh, potential. So this is not one. It might get some kind of dead cat bounce, mm -hmm. but this is not something I'd run into. I think this is going to take some – this, again, will need to form a bottoming pattern and really uh, work work off some of this stuff. And maybe maybe going into third quarter numbers, we'll see if it's – what kind of bottoming pattern is forward. It's formed. Uh, another stock. Unless you're done, if you're no, if, if I want to ask, I'm going to talk about something and ask you to do a quick, uh, right. a quick review of the chart. Gilead, G I L D. I don't have it in the show notes, but there's been reports on Gilead. They, Gilead, so Gilead Sciences is a pharmaceutical company, and they've been like a Wall Street darling. People have loved this stock. It moves in one dollar ranges all day long, and uh, there's been a lot of trading of this stock. There's been a lot of uh, it's been a Kramer stock for a long time which makes me immediately want to sell it. But it, it, Gilead scientists gets two-thirds of their revenue from their hepatitis C drug, which cures hepatitis C. So they're theoretically curing their market. In other words, they're destroying their market. They've also got an HIV drug, but it's it prohibitively expensive. A lot of people say they're the next target for this um, uh, same the EpiPen uh, scandal. They said they're the next target in terms of like the HIV drug. And the hepatitis C drug is not cheap, but the hepatitis C drug is a cure. So getting two thirds of your revenue from a market that you're eliminating with the product. And the other thing is they don't have any other products to note, like any other products of note other than these two drugs. They've got things in the FDA, just like every pharmaceutical company does. But I wonder, like, if this can fall out of favor, if it's a Wall Street darling. I mean, I think the chart looks awful. The chart looks but, horrendous. Yeah. So what do you see on the chart? Do you see anything? I mean, I don't want to short it. I just, like, this is one of those stocks people love to trade it. And because it's been beat up so bad, I've gotten calls saying, hey, is it time to buy Gilead? And I, when I looked into them fundamentally, I'm like, why? It. It's not time to buy it from a technical perspective. It had bounced off its 200-week uh, moving average back into our declining rotation zone. Then it broke below that, retested the 200 on the underside, and now that support it had made when it was retesting and it sort of made a small little horizontal channel, we just broke below it. We're going to close below that horizontal channel this week. We're into another major clear path move. With no significant support until around the sixty-five to sixty-eight dollar range. Yeah, I thought it was ugly. So I just want to make sure you know this again, not something I touch. Yeah, looking at it, you know, from a just a fundamental perspective, it's like yeah, they got a ton of cash, but a lot of pharmaceutical companies have a ton of cash. If you have no products and you're curing your market. Again, they don't have no products. They've got an HIV drug and they got some other stuff out there. But if you if you two thirds of your revenue, you're eliminating that market slowly. 
Um, and Hep, Hep C cases are have fallen like 12% reports of new cases. And again, Gilead cures it. So that's going to continue to happen. You can't give someone a disease you've been cured of. So it's just going to keep happening. So I just want to tell people that's a very popular stock. And I had somebody ask me this week if it was time to buy it. I said no, but yeah, just wanted to get I your take on it. technical perspective, I'd agree with you. Yeah. You wanted to talk about – did you want to talk about Salesforce, CLM? Yeah. Uh, Mark Benioff, the CEO of Salesforce, did something I thought was pretty cool. Um, but it also – and the reason I thought it was cool is because it's the kind of comments that make you want to stay away from his stock, which because he just came right out and was honest about it, it kind of makes me want to buy the stock in a weird way. Now, the chart's not in a position where you're going to buy the stock. As a matter of fact, um, it, it's got a pattern. Um, I didn't measure out the pattern, Mikey, on the weekly. It, it fits. It fits? Okay. Yes. It doesn't look like we're going to close below it for a short trigger. Who knows? I mean, we've got a full day left. Well, but uh, let's let's talk. It's got go ahead, a double, talk about the pattern. Let's talk. It's got a double top pattern. It's got a confirmed double pop top pattern. We and because it's broken below the base, it does not have a triggered double top pattern yet for us. The trigger would be on a close below seventy eight thirty three. Right now we are trading at uh, seventy five sixty five. So again, the close we need to close below the. Wait, what's that? Well, hold on, the low. I was just I was going to say it's seventy five fifty one. Yeah, sorry, seventy five fifty one. So we're we're it, it could trigger today. It might not. If it does trigger, it's a pretty pattern. It's a very pretty pattern that would put us down around the target would be about the sixty six, uh, thirty nine level. Yeah, I mean, there's a little rotation to the left that might cause people to not get in it, but I would get in it on a short if it did trigger because it's just a very pretty pattern. That rotation doesn't bother me. But from a fundamental perspective, basically Benioff said that uh, the company's undeferred – or I'm sorry, unbilled deferred revenue rose 29 percent to $8 billion, but they guided down. And he basically said, I don't know why we're going to be weak. He said, we have definitely underperformed, and we're not sure why, but we're going to figure it out. And I thought that was a really cool thing because you don't hear that kind of thing from a CEO. He guided down, but they usually blame the market. We've had a lot of blaming of the weather over the last couple of years, although I don't know how CRM would blame the weather. But, <laughs> you know, a lot of the analysts came out, like Jeffries, for example, said, we, we don't understand Mark Benioff's statements. We're looking for uh, clarity. We don't understand. Um, Kramer, who, again, I make fun of more than I like, um, said Benioff earned the respect of the market, and it might actually be able to hold a bid to the stock. But I'm going to go strictly on the pattern that Mike just talked about. And if it doesn't close below, I wouldn't short it. If it closes below, I would because the pattern is so nice. But again, even Benioff himself said, we have problems, and we don't really know why. He goes, we're making a lot of money, so we'll be able to figure it out because our customers are loyal. Uh, we're getting new customers, but we're guiding down because we think we're going to slow and we need to figure it out. I thought that was really cool. Very good. Did you see that uh, Google slash Alphabet is getting into the uh, ride-sharing market? Yeah, well, why are they not calling that Goober? <laughs> Goober. <laughs> that should be it. That's a no-brainer. Google Uber. Goober. <laughs> Goober. Are you taking a Goober today? Yeah, you know, McDonald's always had a Mick before something. Yeah, and Google should always have a Goo before everything. Goobers are a registered trademark of some chocolate candy company. Yeah, I'm sure they are, but yes. so we, Google has money. They could just maybe they should just buy the candy too. They could call it Oofabet. <laughs> Oofabet. I mean, they but should always mix it like that. This is actually pretty interesting. First of all, they're only doing it in San Francisco. And uh, did you? They, they're this is pretty. It's actually a real sort of ride share market because it's it uses the the Waze app and it pairs you up with somebody going in your direction and. It's only at a, a rate of fifty four cents a mile. So I love the I love the Waze app. I've been a huge fan of the Waze app since I found out about it. Although it's kind of funny because it's the most dangerous navigation system out there. <laughs> no, because you're updating things. Because <laughs> you're, you're updating driving. things while you're driving, and then it says, "Uh oh, you can't do this unless you're a passenger. Click passenger." And I always click passenger, and then I drive an update. So it's terrible. <laughs> it's it's a terribly dangerous app. 
They should do something about that. But it's very, it's really efficient. It really gets you around traffic well. I really like it. And this is kind of, you know what this is really cool for? If you get transferred to another city and you need to make friends, <laughs> I would sign up for that. I mean, you're getting your gas paid for basically, right? And you, you meet people. It's kind of cool. Yeah. It is. Kind of, so we'll see. But this is all going to tie into, you know, because Google's got its self-driving car and Uber's going after its self-driving. So you're going to have the self-driving, the war of self-driving cars eventually. Yeah. You know, who's going to use this a lot is like real estate agents. They get in your car and be like, hey, if you're ever looking to sell a house, here's my card. <laughs> That's me on that bench we just passed. Once they add Tinder, it's all figured out. Oh, oh boy. Jeez. <laughs> I don't, what is Tinder? <laughs> I, I I think I think it's a great idea. I really do. I think it's brilliant. Oh, I don't believe you brought that in, Stafford. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's not some jerk get in my car with his coffee and spill it. I don't know if it'd be coffee. He he spills it all over my seats. I'm so sorry. Man, fifty two cents a mile or whatever I'm getting. I got to get new seats. <laughs> so why would you have to get new seats? I just could I don't like coffee smell in the car as much as I love coffee. All right. Speaking of coffee. <laughs> Fitbit? Why, why are you laughing? <laughs> oh, what? I didn't go to Fitbit. Because I knew you were going to go to something that had nothing to do with coffee. Uh, I, well, I was going to even make it a farther stretch than that. But since you, you made the transition to Fitbit, they're coming out yeah. with their new, their new wearable fitness trackers and charge to and flex to, uh, you know, it, functional upgrades that could help take on the competition, although I really don't. Oh, they've got guided breathing exercises now with them. So, Do you guys think this is a fad? I, I, uh, I'm going to go to Stafford on this. Stafford, do you think these wear, wearable fitness devices are a fad? It's as much as a fad when you had to buy a calculator as one of your school supplies, and now oh. your calculator is on your phone, right? So at some point, all this stuff will be integrated. You won't need a separate fitness device. Yeah, you know, kind of, like Apple already has that to a certain degree. I mean, they don't have the – like you can count your steps on Apple, and they have a – uh, a setting where you switch it to I'm on a bicycle now. Right, and all the you know, iWatches and a lot of these watches all have because my iWatch and I, whenever I work out, you know. Remember I, when the iPod was a thing and it held a thousand songs? Now, wh who cares about having something that... Yeah, something? It's, it's... What was it? it just, just, that was like a drop the mic moment. He's falling and he can't get up. <laughs> yeah, you were talking about that it was too much fitness but i just wanted to bring this up uh because we've looked at fitbit nothing yet for me in the fitbit stock uh it's really it's it's forming a nice base but there's no possible trigger anytime soon it would it really has to get above the 18 25 mark before, or 1850 mark before i'm even considering looking at this stock and right now we're trading at 15 and there's not much buzz based off these new wearable devices so uh they're so careful with these fad stocks i mean august of last year a year ago yeah, this thing was at 51 dollars yep it's just crazy that people just buy these things up like this yeah, I know it was it, it was it was another uh what were those plastic shoe thingies this, Alligators? No, no, Crocs. Crocs. <laughs> Alligators. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you were close with a reptile, yes. Was... And it was in the reptile family. Yes. Well, I, I also just brought up the – so nothing going on in Fitbit. I also just brought up my iWatch, which we can tie into Apple with their big news this week from the EU commission. Mm -hmm. uh, they they must repay this just really fried me too it's been a week of really frying me uh, pay us 14.5 billion irish tax breaks you know with penalties it could be 21 billion whatever blah 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 uh the commission says because the deal gave apple a significant advantage over its competition the iphone maker must now be prepared to pay illegal state aid over a 10-year period before it began investigating its tax practices what so the, can you it, say I regs it? Yeah, but it, Ireland doesn't want this. No, they're they like, don't. They're protesting it, and them doing this right after Brexit, I can't believe it. 
They cannot believe it. Yeah. If anyone wonders, so Apple already has said privately, I haven't seen it in the news, but friends of mine that work at Apple have said to me that the talk in the company is their Irish operations being moved to the UK because it's easy. Yep. And they're oh, just, there's going to be, this is why Ireland's protesting it because they're, they, they, they're vowing to appeal the European Commission's judgment. But the Apple, I was reading this week, this deal that they put in place, which they, that they both sides have said, Tim Cook like did a 25 minute interview on it this week. And, mm. you know, both sides says, I think this deal was originally put in place in by, uh, by Steve Jobs. Well, right when he came back. No, it, it, the original thing goes back to 93. Yeah, they were building, but they were building computers back then. They were building actual yeah, computers. Yeah, but the whole agreement that they originally came up with Ireland, which was they say is not preferential because other companies have done it with the same way as available to anybody, traces back to 93. And uh, it's, that, uh, Ireland's just pissed. Yeah, they don't want it. Because they're, they're like, like Look, we don't Apple want the money. And the money would go to Ireland. fantastic. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, Treasury Secretary Liu doesn't want it because the money would come from the U.S. It wouldn't come from Apple because what had happened – well, it, it would. Apple would have to pay it. But then Apple had – we have an agreement where we deduct foreign taxes from U.S. corporate right. taxes. Yep. So it, uh, that's money that won't get paid to the U.S. Yep. if and when that money ever gets repatriated. So let, let me just be entirely clear here. The money is not earmarked for the U.S., even though Apple says it is. They, says they, they say they would pay it from money earmarked to be repatriated to the U.S. So they're saying that to get Lou involved. So Jack Lou comes in and goes, wait, you guys are going to pay that to us? Okay, hang on, EU. Why are you doing this? But, I mean, it's just going to cause more exits. Irregs, let's call it a, a St. Patrick exit. Same for Ireland. Exit. Well, now St. Patrick exit. Did you see that now they're going going to go after Amazon and Mac McDonald's next? This is idiotic of them. You know this, what? But it's typical of politicians. Yep. It's very typical. You know Let's what? Just our, reach for money. If our government was smart, they'd immediately say, "Okay, you want to re you want to get out of this repatriate because we have a stupidly insane thirty five percent corporate tax rate, which should be what, redone." What would yeah? What would trump this would be the fifteen percent. That's been talked about. No pun intended. I don't know what or you're talking. Intended. Don't know what anyone's talking about. Don't or even, pun intended. Don't bring that up. But I think this <laughs> that the the uh the our government, if they were smart, should say, okay, you're going to go down this path. Fine, repatriate the money. You know, whatever, 10, 15 percent. Well, okay, bring it all back in, guys. We're gonna we're gonna reform the corporate tax code, which should be done anyways, and we're going to be competitive in all these – you guys want to – EU, you want to go after all these companies? We're just going to take advantage of it. Bring it all back here, guys. It's but, unbelievable. But that won't happen. It might. This might be the – well, that won't, what, the way you describe it won't because that would be easy and unpolitical, yes. um, non-political, nonpartisan. It, this it could be the spark, though, where we finally get corporate tax reform, maybe not as, as – like – dramatic as you and I would want it, but this could be the spark, especially if they continue to go after. While Apple is appealing this, which obviously they will, and they will not just pay it, they're going to go through all kinds of things to appeal it. They're going to they're going to take it to the highest courts they can. And the you, could, you saw that the Apple CFO said the numbers even made up. Yep. Even if we agreed that this wasn't just theft, the number they come up with is wrong. Yep. And the thing is, is Tim Cook is a pure operations guy. He mm -hmm. loves this kind of political numbers stuff, and he has vowed to repatriate this, be, repatriate this money. So I can only think that he'll have pre put pressure to make it happen. Hey, Bob. Yeah. You mentioned Spark. Yeah. I did. I got, this takes me to Elon Musk corner. <laughs> did you just the weekly of? Elon Musk corner. Yes. Did you see what happened oh, to the SpaceX If somebody had rocket. died, that would be in bad taste. But since <laughs> nobody did, it was fine. Yes, because the SpaceX rocket was on the launch pad yesterday. Was it yesterday or the day before? Day before. Yeah, and uh, with a Facebook satellite on board for to help more people in Africa get on Facebook. Conspiracy. Uh, but they were doing a test. This was not actually a launch. It was they were doing a test. They were what? What were they doing, Stafford? They were pressurizing the uh, upper oxygen. Elon Musk uh, tweeted that they were doing pressurization tests, which they need to do before they go to launch. 
So it went boom. Yeah. So conveniently. <laughs> it was a four minute long explosion. Yeah, it was the video was pretty, <laughs> pretty it's a four minute video. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg was quoted as being deeply disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> that his two hundred million dollars was gone. They insure those things, right? Yeah, I think I, I, I guess somebody like you insurance on it. Uh, somebody like AIG or State Farm. Should did you be see what I put on? Did you see what I put on my, uh, my Facebook and Twitter today? Uh, should, I did not. You should actually go read it. Uh, it's a hypothetical uh, back and forth texting thing between Zuckerberg and uh, Elon Musk after this happened, and it's pretty, pretty funny. It so, is it? It's, it's yeah. more than hypothetical. It's pure satire. It's funny as anything. That's why I had to post that. But also, <laughs> speaking of explosions, this ties in. I'm doing a three-way tie-in. All right, I, I get kudos for this one. All right. All right, we already touched on Apple, and you mentioned the Spark. Mm-hmm. Now we the spark was the Elon Musk SpaceX going kaboom. You know what else is blowing up right now? Mm. Samsung, their new Galaxy Note sevens. They're doing a global recall on them because so far thirty five have blown up Hold on. with battery issues. So, which is really not good for Samsung because they were this phone was supposed to be really really good if it didn't explode on you and. Apple's releasing its its launch event for the iPhone 7 is next week, right, on the 7th. Mm-hmm. So it's sort of like Samsung was really poised to, hey, look, we got, we're got we going to really kick the iPhone's butt, and now they have to do a global recall of them. I just thought if you're going to mess something up, that's a really bad time to have to do it, especially when you came out with a good product had it not exploded. Yeah, let's see if that affects sales of Samsung like, Chipotle has been affected. Well, you've wanted to keep buying it. and no, me, listen, I'm not. It's, I want to buy it, but I'm not running away from the charts. It's point. still in. It's It could be forming a, a bottoming pattern, more a horizontal channel pattern, but we still got the rotation zone against it. You know, right now it's trading 410. It was back down last week in the 390s. So, yeah. This is something that's got to really form a good base pattern before I'm looking at it. Now, I just got to touch on what one more government thing, though. What? I just uh, because it's, it's, again, we're in scary place. Mm-hmm. You're watching. You're watching. Sort of the what did you say? The end of Rome. Yeah, the fall of the Roman Empire. Although the Ro- Roman Empire is most of the developed world, not just one country. <laughs> yeah. Well, in our in our did you see that foreign hackers uh, attacked two state election systems? They got into Illinois and Arizona. That, that's <laughs> if, look, not... if a Republican wins Illinois, then you know it was hacked. Yeah. <laughs> You know it was hacked. Clinton has a 25-point lead in Illinois, and we haven't voted for Republicans since Bush won in the first election. Uh, here's, since George Bush won. Here, here, here's what the headline that came across after this a little while later. The Department of Homeland Security began considering declaring the election a critical infrastructure, giving it the same control over security as over Wall Street and the electronic power grid. Yeah, the guys who – okay. This is against the Constitution. This is against the Constitution. The states have rights to control voting. It is not a federal issue. So this is, this is a power grab. And this is the uh, first time the Constitution won't stop something. <laughs> um, I, I mean, absolutely, Stafford, and you're right. And, I, again, I don't want to get terribly political, but – I hate getting terribly political. We're going to give this to the same FBI who said Hillary Clinton broke the law, but we don't see a reason to indict her. Is that the same FBI that wants this? This is this is well. This is Department of Homeland Security. This is the same people you know that run our wonderful. Uh, you, take, you know, take your shoes PSA off. And, yeah, go through the magnetron machine, and who knows? And what by the does. way, when I meant Illinois Republican Bush won, I meant the first Bush, George H. W. Bush, senior, the election in nineteen eighty eight. That's the last time that Illinois voted for a Republican. Wow. So close to 30 years ago. All right. <laughs> that, uh, that's just, I, just the whole, uh, okay. So go ahead, Mike. Well, I'm just, that was just my scary, my scary government news of the week. We might have to have a politics show before the election. I don't know. 
I don't know if we should do that or not. A politics show? Yeah. I agree. That will be BS. All right. Well, we got- our, I think we need to go into our what and why segment. The what and the why. Today's edition of the what and the why is brought to you by Motive Wave Software. Motive Wave Software is a well-established developer of easy-to-use, full-featured charting, analysis, and trading software built for the individual trader. Motive Wave offers the best charting tools used by the pros, such as Elliott Wave, Fibonacci, Gartley, GAN, and Ratio Analysis, but it's presented in a very easy-to-use way. Motive Wave has a product to fit any budget and any trading style. And one of the very best features, it's available on Windows and Mac. So go to pathtradingpartners.com right now to get your 14-day free trial. And then visit them at motivewave.com. Mike, why don't you do your why first? Because I, I my what is somewhat related to it. What, I, I'm the what guy and you're the why guy. I'm sorry. Why don't you do your what first? Because my why is somewhat related to it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay. This is actually... Hey, Mike, what are you thinking about? uh, What am I thinking about? I'm thinking about a massive potential double bottom on a weekly time frame in the Japanese yen. So this is a U.S. dollar Japanese yen. uh, Still a bit away from, from triggering it, but we're getting the rotation zone out of the way. It would have to get above a high of... 107.48 107.48 to really trigger. But the reason I'm bringing this up a little early is because a lot of people are expecting Japan to announce some new major, major stimulus package to try to weaken the yen further in September. And if they do do something, this could move very, very fast and it would essentially target the yen going to the 116 level and on a side note <laughs> another reason i want to bribe this up see i got to put this in the other part of the show but then i wouldn't have had a what but then i'm going to go into a side note that the bank of japan and the government pension investment fund has they've run out of bonds to buy and now they're just <laughs> outright there there's no more bonds to buy so they're just buying stocks uh and in essence what the japanese government has done is become the largest shareholder of 474 big companies in japan <laughs> so <Wow. laughs> they're the largest shareholder of 474 companies in japan uh <laughs> they're going to start buying ipos <laughs> they're buying their market off it would be, they are going to be their market I like Mark Zuckerberg and deeply disappointed. (laughs) These central banks are going off the rails. But remember, it's good for equity prices. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) All right. Here is why, because I'm the why guy, trading news is so bad. When we look at the reaction of the equity markets and what those reactions theoretically mean, When Janet Yellen started talking last week, we were on the podcast, and the market initially started falling because she was talking about rate hikes. Then she turned that back a little bit, and the market rallied. Then Stanley Fisher came out and said that, no, she absolutely meant we might hike rates. And then the market fell, and then it rallied. So you saw three sides of the same conversation, and the market fell rallied, fell, and rallied. So why did all those things happen? Well, the market fell initially because it thought easy money was going to start coming to an end. Then it rallied because they thought easy money was going to continue. Then it fell because it thought easy money was going to come to an end again. Then it rallied because, wait, maybe the economy is actually strong enough to withstand a rate hike. So then when some weak data or some strong data came out, some strong economic data, the market rallied even more this week because it said, oh, look, the economy is strong and the Fed will raise rates. But you know what? The economy is strong enough to deal with it. Then we got weak economic data or rather expected economic data in the uh, form of the uh, consumer spending numbers and the market fell, right, because the, the data was regular, it was normal. And now the Fed was still going to hike rates. It wasn't exceptional data like the previous durable goods number was. And then today we get a weak payrolls number. And what's the market doing? It's rallying. 
Well, now the dollar was selling off earlier. Now the dollar. And now the dollar's rally. Back. Right, the dollar's rally. So the S and P rallied at the weak payrolls number, thinking, "Oh, okay. Well, now the Fed won't hike, so it's okay that the market's a little weaker than we thought because guess what? Now the Fed's not going to do anything, so easy money continues, and we're going to rally." Trading news is awful. It's absolutely awful for the average person. If you're an active trader, or if you're an investor, it's it's almost like you should ignore it even more. But if you're an active trader, you should ignore it. Right now, we've got the S&P up about a half a percent as I talk, as I talk, as I speak. We've got the transports up about three quarters of a percent as I speak. We have dollar yen up about a little more than three quarters of a percent as I speak. We've got the euro US dollar down, which means the dollar is stronger versus the euro, a little bit more than a quarter of a percent as I speak. And we've got crude oil all the way down the 44 handle, but up two and three quarter percent. I'm sorry, two and a quarter percent on the day. And then you look at the overall dollar index, as Mike mentioned, the dollar index ended up weaker, or I'm sorry, ended up weakening as the initial jobs number came out. Excuse me. But now it's rallied all the way back and is up a quarter of a percent as I speak. My point is this, is that the why of things, which is what I talk about, is fun. It's a lot of fun to talk about why things are happening. It leads you into fun political conversations. And you end up being the smartest guy in the room, even if you don't really know what you're talking about, like myself. But you have to trade price. You have to trade price action. Because literally, there were four movements off of three statements and three different sentiments. And those movements had to be extrapolated three and four different ways in order to figure out why the market was doing something. And all of that was after the fact. So remember that even though like understanding why things happen might be fun, you will lose money like crazy as an individual trader or investor if you trade off of why. That's very good advice. And can I just bring up one more thing that Reuters just came out with? Yeah. <laughs> this ties into Japan. Uh-oh. Look at all these good tie-ins today. A lot of tie-ins. The, the ECB may soon be forced to follow the Bank of Japan's example and buy equities as part of the expanded stimulus program. Uh, they're running out of bonds to buy also. <laughs> wow. I mean, I guess old people should buy stocks, retired people should buy stocks because the central bank's going to keep them up. I I mean, listen, I'm not actually giving that advice, by the way. No, do not give that advice because this is all not going to end well. But now it looks like they're they're already floating it out there that the European Central Bank could run out of eligible bonds for its 1.7 trillion euro euro bond buying scheme. I like that scheme. Scheme. It's a scheme, but now they're going to go. Hey, what? Governments just buy all the stocks. I have an idea. Can, can can this Money Path podcast issue some bonds and help these guys out? <laughs> well, we, they could buy our stock. Yeah. We could have private stock. They could buy us. Well, that's a good that would be thing. amazing. That'd be great. Isn't this a form of nationalization, though? If, if they just start buying up all the stock of private companies, isn't it essentially that all these, these central banks uh, just own the companies then? <laughs> Ugh, unbelievable. I... um. I am going to go revoke my citizenship today. Yeah, my choice. My choice was going to be Italian, but that's a bad idea. <laughs> well, they're horrible. running out of bonds to buy. Too. <laughs> it's a horrible idea. Ireland's doing pretty good. They're pretty flush. I am a. I am going to go over there and I'm going to um, politic for the St. Patrick. <laughs> the St. Patrick's it. I'm Bob Icino signing out to practice St. Patrick's it.